All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our Risk Assessments Rationalized webinar. I'm hitting enter for the slide to click to the next slide and it's not cooperating here, so please bear with me. Technical difficulties, I don't know why. In the meantime, um, I'm John Nelson, uh, Associate Attorney at uh, Three Lions, and um, uh, Martin Gwynn, our Director of Operations, is with us. And actually, um, John was trying to fill the empty air like they do on television, but he's actually, associate, he's actually an Associate Attorney with the Digital Business Law Group, not with Three Lions. But, um, so, I'm Carlos Leva, I am the CEO of Three Lions. Uh, and um, also the CEO of, um, um, well, well, attorney and managing partner of Digital Business Law Group. See, John, you got me all, you know, you got me all discombobulated now, man. So, all right, what are we going to cover today? Our learning objective, uh, objectives, background, risk assessments, and really how they can be rationalized. And we're using rationalized as uh, a word that that means essentially expedited, simplified, etc. And we're we're going to talk about how, how that works. We can go over some basic vocabulary, the NIST methodology for conducting risk assessments, when you should conduct them, and who is on the hook. Now, uh, for people that have attended the webinars in the past, you know that we like to take questions as we go. So um, Martin, Director of Operations for Three Lions, um, will be um, trolling the, the chat and you can put in your questions then and at the appropriate time he will either he, he will either interrupt me and ask a question or I'll just take a pause and say Martin are there are there any questions that we need to address so what we want to do today is provide a foundation understanding of risk assessments under the HIPAA security rule and understanding of the vocabulary, you really need to know the lingo because otherwise you, you won't be able to see the forest for the trees and there's quite a bit of lingo that you need to master, although at the end of the day, uh, it, it's fairly straightforward once you get you know, by the initial shock. Methodology that, that we uh, evangelize and propose is agile, repeatable, and verifiable as far as a, a, an authoritative methodology, we borrowed the methodology from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, and they have a special publication that deals with how to conduct risk assessments. I don't know, I may be mistaken on the number, I think it's 800 SP 30, but if you look, if you do a Google on NIST special publications, you'll find that whole long list. I don't know, they got about 30 of them. One of them does deal with specifically with conducting risk assessments. Uh, and it's not specific to HIPAA right away because um, um, straight away, as the Brits would say, because NIST is responsible for providing guidance to all government agencies around risk assessment, cybersecurity. So it's kind of a generic uh, standard. Talk a little bit about the timing, uh, significant changes to your operational environment clearly triggers a risk assessment, any material changes to applicable law, and really uh, the thing that should be triggering a risk assessment in your mind is the changing threat landscape on a daily basis. The bad guys keep getting smarter day by day, and so we recommend at an absolute minimum, right, that you should be conducting once a year. If you're not conducting once a year, you're so far out of the game that, you know, the world has changed too much. Really. If you want to make a good faith argument that you are doing the appropriate thing, I would think that the minimum uh, is more like once a quarter. And frankly, uh, as we talk about Espresso and what Espresso can do, which is a product that uh, will help expedite risk assessments that we're going to talk about because we're going to be shipping that as part of our subscription in a couple of weeks. You could even get to the point where you're doing it uh, once a month in, in, a, in the least painful way possible. Okay, talk a little bit about who the responsible parties are, the compliance officer and the executive team for sure are going to be on the hook, and what constitutes a minimum viable risk assessment. So net-net, we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your HIPAA risk assessments should be conducted now that HIPAA is no longer a paper tiger. I'm sure everybody is aware that there are real fines. 
science real breaches that the game has changed and it, it was no longer um, a paper tiger okay and I, I believe all indications show that uh, HHS is probably going to enhance and become more um, aggressive with its in, uh, enforcement action so you're going to conduct a risk assessment you're going to touch all three rules, the HIPAA privacy rule, the HIPAA security rule, and the HIPAA breach notification rule, um, all three of them have uh, risks associated with them and you, you obviously most, um, most of the focus is on the HIPAA security rule but you can't forget the other two rules that do come into play at least tangentially. The goal is to, um, along the continuum, risk assessments in the whole, your entire HIPAA compliance initiative is an iterative project that you're going to be working on forever. It never ends. Okay, this is not a one-time set and forget exercise, especially with respect to risk assessments because the threat landscape is changing so rapidly. Okay, so your goal should be to continually build a better HIPAA compliance story or narrative. Right? Not story as in something that you're inventing, a narrative that is actually reflects the reality of what you're doing on the ground with being fully compliant as this kind of moving target that's aspirational, it's what you're working towards, you may never get there because things change. So before we get into you know, the rationalization part of and the methodology part of a risk assessment, let's go through some basic uh, vocabulary, and I'm just going to ask Martin, is there any questions up to this point? Not at this time. Okay, so you guys can read these definitions. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to point some out that, that if you don't know, part of doing a risk assessment means taking an inventory. And when people think of inventories, they usually think of assets. You know, uh, either tangible or intangible. Mostly, it's tangible, right? Your networks, your PCs, your servers, your mobile devices. Some of them intangible. Your information systems. You know, a, a building. I mean, these are things that everybody recognizes as, as assets. We're going to see that really what what you need to take stock of and what you need to take an inventory of is what we call security objects. It's it's much broader than an asset. Okay. Availability and confidentiality and integrity, those are the three things that you're supposed to protect with the um, security rule. That's the whole intent, okay? Um, and for example, in ra ransomware, uh, you know, it says ransomware or breach. Well, sometimes not. Sometimes there was no breach. Sometimes they the hackers just managed to get a hold of the data and encrypt it in a way that they didn't really steal it. Maybe it was encrypted to start with, but they're holding you hostage. And so, and so the PHI that you need, your patient's data is not available. Well, that may, that's not a breach. That may not be a breach that you have to report, but it's definitely a violation of security rule. Okay? And the same thing with integrity, uh, you know, because Maybe, and in the case of uh, Melbourne Hospital that kicked off all this ransomware stuff about a year ago, um, they, the bad guys, were actually changing patient data, right? And so then the, the, then the integrity of the data was compromised, and uh, in that case, it was both a breach and a violation of uh, the security rule. So let me cover some um, terms here that are going to be important uh, to the risk assessment, uh, to the risk calculation, and they're therefore important to uh, risk assessments. Imp the idea of an impact is the magnitude of harm that can be expected to result from the consequences of unauthorized disclosure of EPHI, unauthorized modification, unauthorized destruction, uh, etc. Uh, what this really says in, 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 in the risk equation is what is the magnitude of harm? You, you might say, if you were speaking in general terms, lay terms, you might say to your business, they, they have a much more sort of militaristic 
uh, and I think for healthcare, maybe more on point, what is the magnitude of harm to your mission, right? And most missions of healthcare providers is something like the, to provide the best quality healthcare that we can to our patients, you know, at competitive prices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we talked about integrity, likelihood, okay? Likelihood, a weighted factor based on subjective analysis of the probability. NIST does not recommend that you do any kind of mathematical uh, sort of calculation because many have tried and everyone that has tried has failed. So even though later you, you'll see that we represent risk uh, in what looks like a mathematical equation, it's really subjective, okay? The, the fact that you have a threat that may exploit a, a, a vulnerability and you assign a probability to that sounds like you're doing some sort of statistics, regression, anal you know, regression analysis, whatever. The, the, the reality is, is that you're just applying a subjective probability of high, medium, or low. When you're looking to determine the impact to, your, to the mission of your organization, say this threat does exploit this vulnerability, you're also given in a subjective um, probability value of high, medium, or low, okay? And then therefore, the function of the threat exploiting the vulnerability times the impact gives you the risk, which again may be high, medium, or low. So you're really going through this heuristic trial and error learn by doing exercise. There is no mathematical calculation uh, that that uh, that is involved here, right? So operations uh, is important because we we include operations, business processes, and workflows as one of the things that need to be uh, included in your security objects. One of the things that uh, and security objects, in our view of the world, is everything that you might apply a control to. Okay, and we'll see how Espresso applies controls. Uh, in a little bit here, but Espresso implies controls to security objects. The security objects are bigger than assets. They include assets, phones, PCs, servers, pads, all those things you can think of, networks. But they also include your workforce, and they also include operations. So security objects is a much broader definition than just assets, and the security objects is the thing that controls get applied to. So here, here's the definition of risk, okay? So ri risk is the net mission impact considering the probability that a particular threat will exercise, accidentally trigger, intentional, intentionally exploit. Intention is not, does not factor into it, right? You don't intentionally, uh, you know, most people don't intentionally set fire to their operations or, you know, you can't really say that a hurricane happened intentionally. Right, so you know, accidental accidental risks are probably what would happen the majority of time. Of course, there are instances of uh, intentionality, right? They they do occur, but the probability that a particular threat will exercise a specific vulnerability that means exploit it, and the resulting impact to the mission of your organization should that occur. Okay, a risk assessment is. Um, is the process by which an organization identifies threats, vulnerabilities, risks, and then it also identifies the controls that are applied to to those to those risks to reduce them to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Now, one of the things you ha really really have to stress and understand um, is that risk assessment is a purely analytical step. It's an analysis step. You're not doing anything except for gathering your inventory, gathering threats and vulnerabilities. You're not, when I say you're not doing anything, you're not fixing anything. You're just identifying stuff to be fixed, uh, vulnerabilities to be plugged, uh, uh, but you're not actually doing the plugging, okay? So for all intents and purposes, the result, the end deliverable of a risk assessment would be what are the controls that we're going to implement to reduce these high priority risks that we've identified to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. That's the, the, the deliverable from a risk assessment. Now, on the other hand, risk management. Now, both risk assessment and risk management are part of 
the administrative safeguards is first standard. That first standard has four implementation specifications that are all required and probably make up 90% of, of what you need to do with the security rule. Okay? That one, that one standard probably eats the entire rule. Okay, risk mitigation, risk monitoring, risk response. You guys can read that. Security controls, you know, really you can you can have operational controls, security controls, and this talks about physical controls. Really controls for our purposes is you want to rationalize it, simplify it, so you don't, you don't get lost in all this definition. Controls are things that you implement to essentially plug vulnerability, to fix the vulnerability. Okay, that's the mission of a control. Whether it's a security, operational, technical process, whatever it is, what you're trying to do is plug the vulnerability, plug the vulnerability so that the threat can exploit it. Right? The idea being the threat's not going to go away. The threat still is out there in the wild. Okay, what you're trying to do is reduce the risk of the threat exploiting the vulnerability so there's less an impact to the mission of your organization. And with these definitions of uh, technical controls, physical controls, um, really you can break them down into whatever sort of um, uh, taxonomy uh, that works best for your own organization. But, in, but the essential is just you're applying it to the vulnerability in the way that it's uh, instantiated in each of its controls. So if you have a vulnerability with, uh, with your workforce, um, how that vulnerability manifests itself in each, uh, in each member of your workforce may be a bit different, and you can apply uh, controls to the vulnerabilities as they manifest. Correct. And, and so the reason we're pointing that out is that if you start reading, you know, NIST SP30 or whatever the special publication, it's easy to get lost in all this lingo, technical controls. You know, well, what is it? Well, it's something to plug a hole, to plug the vulnerability. All these are right. So yes, like John said, there may be some usefulness, or they may not be. Right, uh, of creating this taxonomy, I, I would only create the taxonomy to the extent that it helps. You. Right. Uh, otherwise, you could use a basic definition that we're proposing and still be uh, none the worse off. Okay. And that's what that's what we're sort of meaning by rationalization. We're trying to break this thing down, and Espresso, our product, tries to break this thing down to make it uh, as as easy as possible. It's not easy, but it's easy as possible to create risk assessments. Okay, all right, and actually multiple risk assessments, and to keep the history of these risk assessments over time so that you could produce them for an auditor or for a court of law. So the definition of threat, you know, the potential for a person or thing accidentally trigger intentionally exploit a specific vulnerability. Okay, that's the threat, right? You know, if you got water as being the threat and you got a hole in your boat, water's the threat, the hole in your boat's the vulnerability, and, and water is likely going to exploit that vulnerability, and if you don't plug that hole, you're sick, your, your ship is going to sink. Okay? So yes, again, like, like controls, you can break these things down into natural threats, human threats, environmental threats, okay? But, you know, it's like those are academic things, right? Break them down into categories in the taxonomy if it makes sense for you to do so. So the threat set, so the threats landscape is usually this. It's not really a database that the bad guys publish. The good guys, the good guys, capture all this stuff like IBM and other players into a database, and there are things that exist in the wild. They're just out there. There are things that are capable of exploiting vulnerabilities in your operational environment. We know they could be hackers. We know they could be hurricanes. It could be fire. It could be your own workforce. You know, committing criminal acts. These threats are in the wild. The threats are always there. Okay, it's plugging the vulnerabilities that you should be uh, focused on. Vulnerabilities, a flaw or weakness in the system, security procedure, design, implementation, or internal controls that could be exercised. And exercise being just another word for being exploited. So, we take another breather here and say, any any questions here? Not at this time. Okay. So, here's the question.
question, what, what are we trying to do? And, and the reason we have this header as agile methodology is, you, you know, when we, when we, when you purchase our subscription plan, and if you've attended our webinars, we're not only trying to give you content that you can use, sample policies, procedures, training. I think we have over 15 training modules now, including how to survive a security rule audit for a privacy rule audit, breach notification audit, on and on. We're trying to provide a methodology, a way of thinking about compliance, and that's this. The compliance is something that is iterative, ongoing. This is not, it's not set and forget. You can't eat this elephant uh, in its entirety in one big bang uh, project, okay? That's the wrong way to think about compliance. You have to stay ever vigilant because the bad guys don't sleep. Okay, they're up 24-7, 365, somewhere in the world, trying to get into your network and trying to access your PHI. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to essentially Katrina-proof your practice. We're trying to plug enough vulnerabilities that Katrina could hit. You could have a Cat 5 hurricane hit your geography and your office, if not your office, at least your data, your PHI would survive intact and that you could potentially, given the tools that are available today, be up and running in a few days. Okay, we're trying to Katrina-proof your argument, your your uh, practice, your hospital, your clinic, etc. And we're trying to reduce risk to re to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Reasonable and appropriate are the words that are used in the security rule. Can't eliminate the risk. Okay, that's an impossibility. There's not enough time or money, right, in multiple lifetimes to eliminate the risk. You're trying to reduce them to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Well, what's reasonable and appropriate, you might ask? Well, ultimately, it's kind of like the negligence reasonable person standard. It's going to depend on what's reasonable and appropriate. It's going to depend on an organization of your size, resources, complexity, yada, yada, right? All these factors that the security rule captures as the flexibility principle it's not one set of things. So ultimately, reasonable and appropriate is something that a court of law or HHS, if they're investigating you, is going to determine, and that will determine whether or not you, you get fined. Okay? So in some ways, we call these weasel words, okay, because it gives HHS an out. Oh, no, you did all that stuff, but for an organization your size, it wasn't reasonable and appropriate. It also gives you an argument. Look, we did this, 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 and this. And, yes, for an organization of our size, we made a good faith effort, and it is reasonable and appropriate, right? So there's this gray area, and that's where the argument usually lies. Um, now, we started out talking a little bit about how this risk calculation that you do um, – is not mathematical, okay? What you need to understand, and, and really, you need to understand this really early on, is that compliance, especially HIPAA compliance now, is not an IT thing, okay? If you treat it as only an IT thing, you throw it over the wall to IT, you're going to fail miserably because most of it is a people process problem, not a technology problem, okay? And the entirety of the administrative safeguards is all about people processes. People and processes, not technology, okay? The technical and physical safeguards have some technology uh, implications. The administrative safeguards, which is 90% of the security rule, is mostly people and process based, okay? So, and most technology projects fail because of people and process challenges and issues. So you just throw it over to IT, and if you think, because you think it's an IT problem, you're almost guaranteed to fail, right? You have to get if you're the compliance officer, if you're the CEO, you, you have to lead from the top. This is a top-down sort of mandate, and you have to actually go on to, to iteratively over time try to change the DNA, the way you think about compliance, okay? So what the security rule is, um, it's really more aptly described as a change project, okay? You're changing the way your organization thinks about risk. Right? And risk assessments, conducting risk assessments, is obviously a big part of that. Right? So an iterative, agile methodology is what's required. Okay? And I think this really 
uh, undisputed now, right? Agile methodologies are used in software, they're used in urban planning, where they where they came from, because we understand that some some uh, problems can only be solved iteratively. Okay, and so to encapsulate that, you have to fail forward fast. Most of you are not going to really understand the problem that you're trying to solve until you try to solve the problem. Okay, and over 30 years ago, Tom Peters, the management guru, before agile methodologies was a bad, uh, was was a buzzword, he came up, he encapsulated this. I think it was thriving on chaos, or or one of those was, you know, uh, or in search of excellence, fail forward fast, learn from your mistakes. Why? Because failing forward fast is the only way to tackle wicked problem, and a wicked problem here. It is wicked is defined as a problem that has social organizational complexity, okay? And there are certain characteristics to wicked problems. First of all, as we discussed, you don't understand the problem. You may think you understand it, but you really don't understand the problem until you've started to develop the solution. I guarantee you that if all you've done is read and studied the rules for the security rule, all right, and you think you have an understanding of the rule, you haven't foggiest idea of how you're going to go about solving that problem until you actually get started and say, oh, oh, wow, I didn't think about that. Oh, this has this implication. You know, exactly. And what we're trying to do is rationalize that process, provide a roadmap for you, and then provide a curated content and a software tool that helps you rationalize it. You're still going to have to get started, right? Uh, but we make it easier for you to get started. There's no stopping rule for this. This is not set and forget. Since there's no definitive problem, like we're going to build this bridge, that would be a tame problem, okay? Because mankind has built thousands and thousands and thousands of bridges. We understand the physics of it, the calculus of it. You know, we we know how to build bridges, right? That that's a problem that's been solved over and over. You're solving the HIPAA security rule problem, or your HIPAA compliance initiative in totality for your organization. That hasn't been solved because every organization is different. So therefore, there's no solutions that are right or wrong. Some are better than others. Some are worse. Some are good enough. Okay, it's a subjective thing. Every wicked problem is unique and novel. Why? Because each organization is unique and novel. It has its own constraints, its own staff or lack of staff, its amount of resources or lack thereof, etc. And every solution is a one-shot operation. You're not going to get 20 chances. 20 bites at the apple if you're the compliance officer. You better come up with a strategy and convince the executive management team that, hey, you know what? This is this is something that we're going to be working on forever a little bit. This is not the old HIPAA where you, you got those 100 templates and you put them in a three-ring binder and you forgot about them, right? And you had these cute little HIPAA things on your charts in various rooms. And that was it. And every once in a while, you provided feel-good training to your to your staff, and you said, "Hey, the world is good. We're HIPAA compliant." Well, no, maybe, but prior to the High Tech Act, HIPAA was never enforced. And if it was enforced, all you got was a twenty-five thousand dollars fine. So, what did most logical, smart doctors decide to do, other than implementing a notice of privacy practices? They said, "Ah." Nobody's enforcing this thing. That was the industry's dirty little secret. And even if they do catch us, it's only going to cost us $25,000. You know what? Let them catch us. That was, that was the strategy. And believe it or not, back in the good old days, that, wasn't, that was a pretty smart strategy. In fact, I'm sure there were, I know there were HIPAA consultants that went around saying, eh, HIPAA, HIPAA, you know, forget about it. But we, we live in a different time. Not only did the high tech act come out, we live in the world of ransomware. We live in the world of global bad guys. We live in a 24-7 online world. In case any of you haven't noticed, the world has changed dramatically in the last, since 2000. And it's changing at an ever faster pace. And we're never going back to the good old days, okay? So that's one thing, right? That those rules that used to apply don't. So what's the, what's the methodology for conducting a risk assessment? And this comes from NIST. We borrowed it. Assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. Now, the assessment part is conducting a risk assessment. The simplify part is, okay, we've identified all this risk, but we only have this so much budget. And remember, that's in the risk mitigation implementation specification. That's the second implementation specification of the first 
administrative safeguard standard. That's the doing part, actually implementing the controls. Okay. Okay, so then protect, actually do, implement the controls, monitor how well your controls are working, and then report out, and then assess again, and, and so forth. Okay, so it turns out that big problems, big, complex, wicked problems require many small solutions. It's just another way of saying you can't eat the elephant uh, at one sitting. Martin, any questions so far? Yes, we do, but we'll start with the public service announcement. The slides for today's webinar are in the handout section. Um, here's the question. Is the risk assessment software different than the SRS that is put out by HITECH? That is the one I used. That is put out by HITECH? Mm. I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean by HITECH. I mean, HHS put out a tool that they called SRS that ran on a PC that really, really sucked and was a disservice because it just didn't work. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I think they've gotten out of the software business. They got, they got, they, they got the, um, they got the message. Well, you know, you're going to, you're going to put out tools that are free and trivial, but that don't do the problem. You're actually creating problems. Now, if you meant, you didn't mean high tech, but you meant high trust, or please clarify what you meant by high tech. Uh, uh, high tech actually is HHS, the tool you just discussed. Yeah, good luck if you're using that tool. That, 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 that in my humble opinion, and, and others in the industry is really a non-tool. I mean, it's better than nothing, uh, I suppose, but it's not really solving your problem. So no, 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 we're not talking about that software. We've created, we being Three Lines Publishing, the HIPAA Survival Guide, have created and are about to ship in a couple weeks a a tool, software-based tool that really addresses risk assessments in a way that um, that we believe uh, risk assessments were intended to be addressed, and can be as uh, they can start out as simple um, as a few hours, two or three, to do the baseline risk assessment because we populate Espresso, it's the name of the product. We populate it with threats, vulnerabilities, and all the controls from the HIPAA security rule. What most of you don't understand, and was an aha moment for us, to be sure, was that what each implementation specification of the security rule is nothing more than a control, okay? A, a control to plug a vulnerability. Therefore, you know, if you don't have a disaster recovery plan, you're vulnerable to a disaster. If you implement this specification, from the security rule that says implement a disaster recovery plan, you, what you're actually implementing is a control that plugs the vulnerability. Okay, so we pre-populate threats, risks, controls, and that's why we enable you to do a risk assessment and produce risk assessment reports in a manner that is that is orders of magnitude. Uh, in fact, really, what HHS put out was kind of a bad toy, but I'm, I'm biased. But any other any other questions along the line? Yes, a um, little follow up um, about that. Our our HIPAA survival guide, Expresso. They the person knows it's going to be out in a couple of weeks, but they'd like to review it, and they're going to redo their assessment as soon as they get the tool, because SRS is all. They had at the time. Yes, yes, that's fine. You, yeah, I mean, you got to start more. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, well, I I think you'll you'll really enjoy it, especially coming from SRS, because um, you know, as Carlos just elaborated on, uh, we uh, we do pre-populate um, a lot of data, actually all of uh, the requirements in uh, in Expresso as risks that we've identified. I think we've got 150. Uh, risks right now for our pre-population. So um, this isn't this isn't a risk assessment in a box. It's not done for you. You still you still need to uh, take a look and say, hey, well, uh, okay, for this risk, what is the impact? What's the likelihood of the threat exploiting the vulnerability? And you can select those levels, you know, high, medium, or low. So there is still work to be done, but it's much much easier um, than SRS or going through spreadsheets or 
uh, or whatever, and um, and it's also scalable. So you can start off with a pretty basic uh, risk assessment that's still meaningful. And you know, as you get more sophisticated, as your organization gets more uh, comfortable and experienced uh, with doing these risk assessments, then you'll be able to make some that are much more comprehensive as you go along. Exactly. Exactly. So you can iterate your way to um, high, higher quality, more rigorous risk assessments, more having more inventory, more security objects. But nonetheless, there's no requirement to do a perfect risk assessment. Okay. It, you know, you have to do a risk assessment, and Expresso is going to produce a high quality, valid risk assessment addressing potentially those 160 risks that we've identified. Plus showing you how you need to implement all the controls that we've identified in the security rule. And we're, we're going to talk more about that in, in, in a second. Um, Martin, are there any other questions? Um, none that are not about um, HIPAA Survival Guide Expresso. Okay, so let me, let, let's go through here. The biggest, the biggest thing you can do is get started. If you just got started with SRS, great. Why? Because you've learned a little bit about how to solve the problem or how not to solve the problem. But in either case, you're further ahead. Because you, you started saying, well, wait a minute, what do I got to do? I got to gather all this stuff. Wait a minute, threats and vulnerabilities. Where do I start identifying? You know, great, right? You, you've learned something, right? So here, here, here's the security rule in a nutshell. It's the first standard, right? This standard requires that an organization implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations. This standard essentially swallows the entire security rule, right? Almost, almost. So under that standard, there are four implementation specifications that are all required. The first one is the risk assessment. That's what we've been talking about, okay? This implementation specification requires that an organization conduct an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risks and vulnerabilities to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI held by a covered entity or business associate. We guarantee you that Espresso is going to allow you to perform an accurate and thorough assessment of the potential risks. Okay, uh, for various reasons. One, we've identified 160 risks, and two, we've identified all the controls in the security rule that you know you need to implement. So if you haven't implemented some of these controls, well then you haven't covered all the risks. Okay? So we take that blank sheet of paper and we throw it away by pre-populating uh, the threats and vulnerabilities that we think that you need to address. Now that's not saying there aren't others that you can add. There will be others that you can add. You will be adding them over time. Lots of them, right? But doesn't it doesn't um, mean that your first risk assessment that covered these 160 are invalid? It's perfectly valid, and this, and HHS understands that each organization is going to is required to get better at doing this. Not required to be perfect the first time out. So the four implementation specifications of that first standard, the uh, administrative safeguards, are all required. The biggest two is a risk assessment and risk management. And again, risk assessment is a purely analytical step. The risk management is actually where you do the doing. Okay, so what are the steps? And this is now getting into what we've rationalized in uh, Expresso. And we're going to show you our initial attempt to capture this, right, and how some people have tried to capture it with spreadsheets. And even for us, where we knew what we were doing, Trying to manage this with spreadsheets was just inordinately complex, and that that became the foundation of Expresso. This is just way too complex. We have to rat. We have to rationalize this more, simplify it more. But the first step is to gather data. Okay, gather data about operations, assets, and individuals. Essentially, gathering your security objects. And what are security objects? Security objects are things that controls are applied to. You apply controls to your hardware, your PCs, your servers, your networks, etc. You apply controls to your operations. You apply controls to your workforce through training, etc., etc. Okay. Some controls are implied applied to all security objects, like disaster recovery. Okay. Here's the thing, though: if you get bogged down and stuck in the inventory process, you could pen, in a large enough organization or even a small organization, you could spend months trying to come up with all the inventory and you, this is just the first step in a risk assessment. In Espresso, we can show you how you can do a valid risk assessment without any inventory at all. Is it as good as it would be with the inventory? No, it's not, but it's still valid. 
you still identified the risk. You still identified controls that you need to plug. And by the way, some controls, some very, very, very important controls apply to all security objects anyway. So what's the sense of waiting until you have all security objects in place? And we'll, we'll see how we get there, okay? Second, you have this idea of you gotta, add, you gotta gather threats and vulnerabilities, and not only do you have to gather threats and vulnerabilities, you have to pair them up. You have to pair this threat with this vulnerability. Well, if you've ever tried thinking about this, and I, and I'm, I am talking about people, I was in tech for a long time, you know, as a, a, a developer, a Top Gun consultant, a project manager, and I know other people within our company have been in tech for a long time. When you first see what you have to do, it, it is a daunting, daunting thing, even for IT people, technology people. What? How do I got to identify the threats and vulnerabilities? You know, it is inordinately complex, all right? And you're starting out with this blank sheet of paper. And so our initial cut was, okay, well, this is totally unacceptable. We got to provide our customers some help. And we did through spreadsheets, okay? And yes, it kind of guided you as to what you would do. It's kind of like, it was kind of like the equivalent of, of the SRA. You know, I, you know, I don't know which ones suck more, the spreadsheets or the SRA, but none of them are sufficient, okay? None of them rationalize the process enough to be really helpful. Step three, and this is, this is not our, this is not our, methodology. This is the NIST methodology, okay, that we just borrowed it. Okay, step three is assess your current security controls and minimize or eliminate risk to EPHI based on well-functioning security controls that you already have in place. So you, you know, you look at what are we doing right now? Are we, are we controlling passwords well enough? Okay, well then you've got a control in place. You know, you don't, you don't need to implement that. In, in, in Espresso, in your baseline risk, risk assessment, you probably would show that you would implement it because you already had it. Okay, but you're further along because you're, you know, you don't need to do it over if you already have it in place. Then you need to determine that, now you remember, by this time you've identified threat vulnerability pairs. Then you need to determine the likelihood that a specific threat will exploit a particular vulnerability. Well, that by itself is, okay, what happens, what happens if Katrina hits? Oh, I mean, there's like, you know, a million vulnerabilities. You know, do we have a disaster recovery plan? Do we have redundant power supplies? Do we have a building that we can move to? Do we have equipment that we could use? I mean, on and on and on and on, right? And, and, and you know, you're, you, the, the, the challenge is that you're stuck in this analysis paralysis. You really didn't even, don't know how to take the next step forward. That's how daunting this thing is, okay? So you have to identify review threat vulnerability pairs that are relevant to your operational environment, assign a subjective probability value high, medium, or low, that the threat in question will actually exploit its corresponding vulnerability. So remember, you're dealing with threat vulnerability pairs, okay? And then after you've identified that, you have to calculate the impact to your mission, the impact that an exploitation of that vulnerability will have on your operational environment. Okay, what's the magnitude of the harm, either economic or reputational? Generally, all risks kind of break down into financial or reputational risk. Yes, I know it's healthcare and safety to patients and all that, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to quantify this as a risk manager, that if you do harm to patients, you know you're gonna get sued. You know you get sued today if you do harm to patients, right? That's gonna be an economic financial cost. And you could have a repu huge reputational cost like Target did when it has its major breach. And really, reputational, loss will eventually break down to a financial loss, right? So unfortunately, you know, it comes down to money, comes down to economics. That's what you're trying to say is what's the magnitude of the harm? Well, you know, lots of ways to think about magnitude. If we're down for five days, what does that do to our ability to practice? Well, probably a lot. What does that do to even our ability to provide medical records? Well, if you don't have an alternative location, if your data's not on the cloud, if it all got wet, like it did during Katrina and you lost of it, all of it, then, you know, your patients could suffer. Your patients could potentially die. What is the impact from this threat exploiting this particular vulnerability? Okay, and then you determine the level of risk associated with the threat vulnerability pair taking into account the impact. 
Okay, so risk level is calculated. Not really, it's not really mathematical, but we use that term as a function of the probability of the threat exploiting a specific vulnerability and the impact that that exploitation is likely to have on your operations. Or if you want to do it in a mathematical shorthand formula, is R equals T times V times I. Threat times the vulnerability times the impact is the risk or the probability of the risk. Okay. And if I can uh, elaborate just on the uh, the calculation or the pseudo calculation of uh, a likelihood of the threat exploiting the vulnerability is, is really one sub-step. And then for impact, uh, once you've already said, okay, that's, let's say the, the likelihood of the threat exploiting this vulnerability is medium. Uh, then for impact, what would the impact be assuming that it was exploited? So, uh, so that would be the second step there. Right, and then you would sign a high, medium, or low value to the impact, and then you would say, okay, given that we have a high value that the threat is going to exploit the vulnerability, and a high value that the impact is going to be high, the impact value is high, then you would think, you know, if you were doing some logic, you know, um, deductive or otherwise, right, you, you would think that the value of the risk would be high, but not necessarily so, because there are other factors that may be at play that say, okay, yes, this, I know this is high and this is high, but really the risk is medium. It's purely subjective. This is where, this is the part that Espresso can't automate, okay? You, we create the risk, we create the threat vulnerability pairs, and then we say, okay, you go in and assign a value, high, medium, or low, that you think this threat will impact this vulnerability. You assign, because you're the only one that knows your organization, what the impact will have, and then you, and then you do uh, assign a value to the risk. Now, some of our competitors will say, well, if it's high, high, then the risk has to be high, and they try to do some mathematical stuff like that's not really math but logic and we've we've rejected that because it, it, because this is really it's, it's a heuristic and so it's not really valid to do that you could have high high and conclude that the risk is medium the, the the thing is you have to think hard about what are these that's where the thinking hard part comes in we've set it up for you but you you got to do this piece of it nobody can do that for you and no certainly no algorithm is going to be able to substitute for your judgment so that you can say, oh, yeah, I wish you guys would have just said high, low, medium means this, and then I wouldn't have to do anything, right? That That's not our approach because I don't think that approach is going to fly legally. That means you did nothing. You never looked at the process, right? So, okay, let me stop here and um, ask Martin if there's more questions. Martin went to sleep on us. No, Martin's right here. Can more than one person use the risk assessment? For example, I am the HIPAA privacy and security officer, but I might want an IT to answer some questions on the assessment. Yes. The answer is yes, but it's a qualified yes. Initially, um, it, it, you, you can two people can be in there. I mean, you're going to have one set of credentials initially, right? So in, in, initially, it's not a like multi-user system. We weren't trying to solve the entire world's problem with that respect. But you can share, uh, you can share the credentials. Okay, you need somebody in IT to go in there. You can go in there and share the credentials, and IT can go in there uh, and do their thing. Later, you know, we may add the multi-user uh, functionality, but that's really not unlike other services that we use, where you know, it's like yeah. You know, you got three or four people that need to get in there and do stuff, share the credentials and, and have at it, right? And, and part of that was so that we could ship something that was extremely useful to our clients without taking two years to add all this other stuff that would have lengthened the time to ship. Do you offer any sample policy templates on your website, risk assessment for small organization, first formal assessment? We we um, we offer as part of our subscription plan. Espresso is going to be purchased has to be purchased as part of our subscription plan. We have 
uh, well over 30 products. So we have all kinds of policies, procedures. We have a, a policy for security rule, for the breach notification rule. Not only a policy, but we have checklists that go through every single requirement of the security rule. They go through every single requirement of the privacy rule, and they tell you three things. Okay, what's the suggested policy for this requirement? What processes should you implement? All right, to support this requirement, and what tracking mechanisms you have in place to be able to track process results. So if you have policies, processes, and tracking mechanisms, then you have visible, demonstrable evidence for the requirement. And our checklists cover the entirety of the 169 some odd requirements, or maybe it's changed now with the second iteration of the audit protocol. So yes, you get espresso, but it's not, you know, if, most of us know, or most of you know, we've been selling a subscription plan with curated content now since, you know, for about three years, three and a half years now. Okay, uh, the difference is it's more expensive now. It used to be seven ninety five. It's now twenty four ninety five. But yes, you get for twenty four ninety five, you get all our content, all our checklists, our fifteen training products. Each training product comes with a question and answer key, and you get espresso. Okay, uh, and then the out years are still optional. But they're twelve ninety five. Let me before I do this. Let me see if there's any other questions along yes. the front. There are. Our inventory is an asset program, so will I have to type it all in the assessment? Well, not to do your first one, right? Because we we're going to show you how you can do a valid risk assessment without any security objects in at all. But yeah, there's no automated. We, we like I said, we're not trying to solve the world's problems. There are. There are literally thousands of asset systems out there. To try to uh, to try to sort of interface to all that is an impossibility. Now, we do allow for the import of security objects to a CSV file, right, John? And we have a we have a published format that if you provide us the security objects in this format, then we will import them. Right. It does have to be in in that in that format, but it allows you to import. As, as many security objects as you want, as well as um, uh, risks, threats. I mean, you can, we, we've allowed you to import each piece, um, but it does have to be in, in the format that we lay out because, once again, I mean, trying to interface with, uh, you know, if we had to make some sort of genie for each, uh, each program that was out there, it would be um, uh, it, it, very time consuming uh, for for us and for our you know subscribers who are who are waiting on this product. So uh, so it does make it easier if uh, if the current uh, software that you're using uh, has some sort of export itself into a CSV or a similar format, then then, uh, then that would obviously uh, speed up the process for you. What would you recommend as a resource for determining a comprehensive list of threats and vulnerabilities? Hmm. So we've identified in the pre-populated data 160, and that's a pretty broad range of them. Um, we included NAT with threats like fire, hacking. We tried to do a pretty rigorous job. Now, if you're talking about, let me let me let me sort of paint this picture. If you're talking about, uh, we we've. We've aggregated some threats into like a particular kind of threat, like hacking. Okay, All right? There is somebody in, an intrusion. Okay, because there are a million and one ways to intrude. That's how you see those uh, security patches being issued all the time. And if you look at IBM's threat database, it, it, there might be fifty thousand different threats. You know, maybe 49,599 are different ways that people can hack your network, okay? Well, once they hack it and they're in, you know, they're in, right? Then they can employ it. So we've tried to say, okay, well, that's an intrusion, right? We don't care that there's 150,000 different ways of intruding from you care. You care as part of, and your IT staff cares as part of, the controls that you need to implement, and that's why this is a never-ending task. But you don't, we didn't feel like we had to identify, because it was an impossibility. We looked at that. You see, this is impossible. You're going to identify 80,000 threats or more? Who knows what the number is, okay? 
So what we mean by rationalization is exactly that. We said, no, this is intrusion. We don't care if there's 50,000 ways to intrude. That's the risk, intrusion. What are you going to do to control that risk? Well, keep your servers updated, patch. Make sure you have you don't have the admin password, the default password, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yes. Will, will a recorded version of this webinar be available later? Only to our subscribers. Sorry. That's how we'll give you the slide. The recordings are only available to our subscribers. Let me get through some of these. This is the detail. I'm not going to spend much time here other than to show you. This is the detail now of the seven steps. First step was gather data. It was an inventory. Gather security objects. This is what we tried to do. And if you bought our subscription with $7.95, you know, we tried to give you some help. We tried to do the spreadsheets, put it together, and it was better than nothing. And I think probably better than the SRA, because I looked at the SRA, but it was still not good enough. It was still too painful to do things in this particular way. The problem was too complex, sort of, okay? But we're showing you gathered inventory. You gathered some of your workforce members. You gathered your uh, databases, your operating systems, your rooms, your PCs. You still have to do that, but you don't need that to perform a risk assessment, at least the first one under under um, Expresso. Kinds of threats, we've rationalized that. Yes, you can break them down, natural threats, human threats, environmental threats. We've, we've created those for you, right? We looked at the problem. We said, okay, these are the threats that we see. Who's the adversary? Well, okay, that's sort of good to know. Is it an individual? Is it a nation? Is it, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, doesn't really figure into that much into uh, you know what you know whether or not they came after they came after you right so okay yes from an informational perspective you, you want to know if it was China or anonymous or something something else but beyond that you just, you know you just have to deal with it right so you're identifying all these threats you're identifying all these vulnerabilities by hand thinking of a way so wait a minute how does this threat go with this vulnerability again. If anybody has tried this problem with spreadsheets or an SRA, you know just how daunting this thing is. Okay? And then the as is is that's not so daunting. You gotta go figure out what you have in place right now. Okay, look at your technical controls, you know, your access controls, identification method, authentication, encryption. What do you have in place today? So you know, then you can use those and plug those in. Okay, and this goes into non technical, physical, uh, etc. So uh, here we go, though. In Espresso, all security rule implementations are treated as controls. That was the big aha thing, all right? For us, that's what we're doing that totally differentiates us from our competitors. We recognize that those implementation specifications that are in the security rule are nothing more than controls that you have to implement. Now, we also borrowed some controls from the uh, Cybersecurity Council, okay? They only had about 20. The security rule had about, I don't know, 30 or something, you know what I mean? Not, there's not this, you know, for, for controls, there's not these thousands, okay? There's this finite number. And so we've identified those uh, from the security rule that must be implemented in order to reduce risk levels that are reasonable and, and appropriate. And Espresso also ships with pre-populated threats, vulnerabilities, and risks. We set the table for you, okay? We also create a default baseline risk assessment. That's just, this is the Espresso baseline risk assessment. It has all the risk, and then your job is to go in there and say, okay, what's the probability, like John was saying, what's the probability of this threat exploiting this vulnerability? Oh, it's high. Okay. What's the impact going to be? Oh, it's low. What's the risk going to be? Ah, it's medium. Okay, that risk is done. Go on to the next risk. And then you produce this comprehensive report that shows what risks, were identified and what controls were applied. And by the way, we've already identified the controls that are applied to the risk because they all came from the security rule. So we've also said, yeah, these are the controls that we're gonna that we plan to implement. That's what we mean by rationalization. We condense the problem down into something that is manageable for you to use right away and it can get as sophisticated as you want it to be. So Espresso completely rationalizes, rationalizes your baseline risk assessment. It also tracks all risk assessments ever performed over time so that you have the historical data that exists forever, or really for as long as you want to keep it, 
right? You're, you're not going to just do one risk assessment. Like we said, minimum probably one a year, but we think minimum should be one a quarter. And if an auditor said, well, show me the one that you did three quarters ago, you could reproduce that in Espresso. Okay, so you're going to have the risk assessment data to show visible demonstrable evidence over time. You can do it in uh, whole or in part as well. Uh, we've got a uh, uh, filtering feature as well. So if you want, if you know for some reason either an audit or or some other circumstance, you decide to go back and say, hey, would uh, what was the situation for this particular subset? You know, like what what were what were my risks looking like? You know, for for our risk assessment two years ago, and you can filter down into that. Um, so it. It provides a lot of um, of power to become uh, that targeted or that broad if you need be. Right, and it doesn't assume that you're going to cover every risk that was identified in your baseline. You may decide, okay, we only have the budget to cover these 10 or 20, and then on the next risk assessment, we're going to cover these other risks. So the risks can be associated with more than one risk assessment because you never got to actually close in the loop on that risk. So this is how you know. This is how you know. Will the threat materialize? This is this is the probability calculation of matching whether a threat will exploit a vulnerability. And this is the equation that we use, right? It's really is that the risk is a function of the probability of a threat exploiting a vulnerability times the impact to your mission. That's going to be risk, and that's also going to be high, medium, or low. So all these are going to be subjective measures of high, medium, or low. Okay, that's essentially the NIST equation for calculating a uh, risk. Again, if you were doing it manually, you'd have to go through all the steps and identify where, what the impact is in the spreadsheet and so forth. Okay, um, I'm going to skip these, right, because you get the picture of what it would take to do this by hand. So this gather, identify, assess, determine, 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 blah, blah, all of this is included in Expresso. The biggest part that that the biggest, more, more potentially most time-consuming part is to get is to gather your inventory. But for example, you, you know who your workforce is, so you could you could get that out of your HR system and import it into Expresso. And so now you have that part of it done. There's no need to have your entire inventory done before you do a valid risk assessment. Nowhere in the security rule does it say. These are the requirements for a perfect risk assessment. It doesn't work that way. And the government uh, can't expect the impossible. They don't. I, I, know, I know some, some people that suffer at the, uh, at the implementation of, uh, and the regulations you know, might want to dispute that just because you, know, you feel like we're regulated to death. But nowhere in the law have I ever seen that it requires some, somebody or someone or some organization to do the impossible. That's not the standard. And that's why you have weasel words built in the security rule as to what is reasonable and appropriate. Okay? So um, other than gather, Espresso really identifies and works and solves for your baseline the identify, assess, determine, 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 uh, and identify the controls part of this for, for your baseline. Okay. Any questions now? <clears throat> yes, there's a couple. What is the format for importing into Expresso? Well, it's comma delimited. That's what we mean by a CSV. Yeah. Okay. So we publish, you know, if you so if you uh, purchase Expresso, we have this manual that says, okay, if you want to import security objects, put them in this format. All right. This is the name. This is the description. This is the date. You know, name, comma, description, comma, you know, blah, comma. Some of them can be null, some of them can't be null. So we provide you the map, and you could take that to your um, IT department and say, okay, you know, from our personnel, uh, from our personnel um, human resources database, we need our workforce. So export it into this format, so we can import it into, uh, so we can import it into uh, Expresso, and from our asset. Export it into the CSV. So for each one of those, we have well, not for each one of those. For e for a security object, we have a CSV file. We also allow imports of threats, vulnerabilities. What 
else, John? Risks? I don't know. I forget. Did we lose John? He's still oh. on here. I, I don't know. Oh, there he is. All right. All right. So, yes, um, security objects, threats, vulnerabilities, risks, controls, and uh, impacts is escaping me. I can't recall if we've got an import for impacts. Okay. Okay. So, a lot of those components we allow you to impact, uh, import via a CSV file. Martin, other questions? Um, not at this time. Okay. Now, uh, I, I know that this... Um, sounds like a commercial for Expresso and it partly is, but we're trying to also demonstrate how you can rat how you can rationalize a risk assessment and learn to think about it in a particular way that is really, really helpful to you, not only for your first one, but going forward. Okay, so if you haven't conducted a risk assessment, you have to conduct one or you're in willful neglect. Right? If you have a breach or you have an audit, you're gonna get whacked. Willful neglect fines start at fifty thousand dollars per violation, right? No risk assessment, you're toast. Yeah, right? Anytime there's a major change, like you move. If you move locations, that's a major change. You gotta do a risk assessment, okay? You're gonna get whacked if you didn't. When warranted by applicable law, well if the law changes, you know, then um, then you may have to do another risk assessment. And to be honest with you, in the world that we live in, it's the marketplace that's taking over, not not just government. Like I said, the bad guys are, are so busy getting smart that once a year doing a risk assessment, realistically, that's you can't do that anymore. You know, I mean, once a quarter is like minimum. Really, there are people out there, believe it or not, that are tracking this stuff real time and doing this stuff once a day. Now, I'm not, the security rule doesn't require that. Okay, and most organizations, healthcare organizations, aren't capable of that. They don't have a full-time staff, but I'm telling you that there's a war going on out there, and once a year, you know, there may come a time when once a year is not reasonable and appropriate. Okay, and more like once a quarter. Okay, so it might be more more defensible as something that's being reasonable and appropriate. Okay, who's on the hook? Well, you are. If you're the compliance officer, you're definitely on the hook. Right. It, or you're involved in it in any other way. You're the CIO. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. Your compliance officer is definitely on the hook. Your executive team is on the hook. Okay. Here's the shameless plug. We've been talking a lot about Espresso. These are screenshots that are old, uh, but oh, wow. they, very old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're very old, but they they'll give you a feel for you know uh, what the UI will look like. It's a totally software as a service, right? So your access to it is over the internet, backed up using Microsoft's cloud, uh, secured, et cetera. Uh, here's a breakdown of what we think security objects are, and you can see it's much more than assets. It's devices, yes, it's servers, PCs, phones, and we, we allow you to classify a security object. Like for servers, you, want to, you might want to implement these controls. For PCs, these. For phones, that. For pad. So you can apply controls at what we call the lowest level of the tree which is devices is a category. Under devices, there's classes. And you can apply security controls to all your security objects, like disaster recovery plan. You can apply them to the category device, which means this security control applies to servers, PCs, blah, blah, all these. Or you can apply it at the security object level, at the lowest level in the tree. But you can see that other things are also security objects, places, persons, networks, processes. These, this is this is why we say that security objects is more than assets. Okay, if you just treat security objects as assets, all you're ever going to achieve is a subset of your security objects. Now, you don't need to do that. I just re reiterate this: you don't need to have all this entire inventory in place before you do your first risk assessment. In fact, in our training for Expressor, we're going to show you how to do a security object list without any security objects. Uh, valid risk assessment, right? But you can easily add certain things. You, you can easily add your workforce, your buildings. You build this, your security objects up over time so that as you do more and more risk assessments, your inventory and your granularity of detail gets better and better. Okay, and you guys have the screenshots, so this is just saying this is a class uh, before we had a device. These are threat types. So you know, natural, environmental. We already did the cat, you know, categorized them uh, for you. Some of them, I think, the ones that ship with Espresso say Espresso, so that you'll be able to determine all the risks that ship with Espresso. They're going to have as a type. They're going to be labeled as Espresso, so that you'll know that this was the 
baseline uh, risk assessment that's shipped with Express. So, and I'll let you guys, um, you know, study these things. So, uh, anyway, Espresso is not the end of the game for us. We're 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 um, creating a platform called Espresso Plus Plus that we're going to add. For example, a docs repository where you can keep all your compliance stuff, all your business associate contracts, all your policies and procedures, all your training, who's done what. We're going to build this repository into another like mini app. You know, we're we're calling the whole platform Espresso Plus Plus. We're going to have a breach notification engine. We already have a breach notification framework that walks you through whether a breach is triggered. Okay, you already get that as part of our as part of our uh, uh, subscription plan. You've gotten that for a long, long time. Uh, and so for, for us to do a breach notification engine, all we're, I'm not saying this is really totally trivial, but all we're doing is taking our breach notification framework and building it, building it into like a stepwise analysis framework where you go through these three analytical steps to determine whether or not breach notification is triggered, okay? And we really expect to be shipping that. The repository we probably expect to be shipping within the next three months. The breach notification engine probably within a year or sooner. But the reason that we're that we're, we're that aggressive is because really we ha we already have the content for the breach notification engine. We have the content to process and all that. We have it in our breach notification framework. We're just going to uh, computerize it. So. You get the entire plan, all our products for twenty four ninety five a year, okay? And you can still buy them individually, by the way, except Espresso. You can buy Espresso individually, but you can buy. If you just want our breach notification framework, if you just want our training products, you can still go out to the store uh, and, and and buy them. And no, by the way, we don't often talk about this, but in Espresso, when you have a control, if it's a control that has to do, if it's a control that is a security rule implementation. You're going to have a URL that you can click to to go read that uh, implementation as it exists in the security rule on the HIPAA Survival Guide website. In other words, you're going to have access to the full source of that control. This is what we're saying you implemented, okay? And and no one else can do that because no one else has a website like the HIPAA Survival Guide. So we already have those links built in some of our products, but this is going to be a more dynamic. Hey, what does this control say? You know, oh, it says it comes from the security rule, but let me go click on it. You click on it, you can go read everything it says that you're supposed to implement. Okay? So we like to think that we provide the recipe, not just ingredients. We provide not only the products, but really a methodology. We're going to do a lot more collateral videos and things like that around our agile processes, right? We've talked about this for years, a different way of thinking about how you do compliance. We're actually going to make that real by, by as part of our subscription plan, um, and, and, and even in just free webinars, talking about uh, visualization of that process, what it means to be agile, and how we've implemented it. Uh, all our products are really intended to educate, uh, starting on day one. They're all agile. They're agnostic as to whether you're a covered entity or a business associate. We call it wetware because it's not just software, it's how to, right? Where, where, where if, if, for example, if you go look at the NIST documents, which are useful as a reference, but if you go look at the NIST documents for how to implement the security rule, and you get to the implementation specification, what they do is they, instead of giving you any how to information, they say, okay, for this implementation specification, these are the 30 questions that you should be asking yourself. Well, you know, when I first looked at that, I said, oh, oh really? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's really helpful. helpful. That's they, really helpful. You know, I'll jump right on that, right? So they play the 30-question game. Why is that? Because the government is never going to be in a position to tell you how to because then you're going to make the argument, well, I did it just the way you said, and now you're saying I'm not in compliance? They're not that dumb. They're not that dumb. They're never going to do that, right? And so, they, yes, the, this, the, it's valuable. It's better than nothing. You know, if you want to go through those 20 questions, the 30 questions, and, and you know, then go find other references to help you, uh, but they're not really useful for how to, okay? So we, we think what we're providing is wetware, like a knowledge transfer mechanism. Um, so, and we think our approach is fairly unique in, in the industry. So 
accept no substitute. And that's our that's our wrap. Uh, we, we will take more questions. Uh, I have one question. Our workforce is large. Uh, it would be difficult if we can't import it. I hope we can import. Yeah, you can you can import that. I mean, workforce is just a subset of your security object. As long as you as long as you uh, put it in that CSV format, you can import it. And it's and scale, have, um, scales too, right? What's that? The, the uh, database scales. So. Well, yeah. We, I mean, this it, it's built on. I mean, we use the latest technology. It's built on Microsoft's cloud. It's built to uh, scale by design. I mean, these are the way all new applications are being built. Nobody like has their own server farm anymore. They use Microsoft's cloud or they use Amazon's cloud, right? So we can scale this thing as large as we wanted. Yeah, is it going to cost us more? Yeah, it's going to cost us more. But you know, we're going to have more customers. So we, you know, we, you know, it'll pay for it pays for itself. So yes, there's it's not a this is an application that was built by design to scale from a small organization to a large hospital to Kaiser Permanente if they wanted to implement uh, Espresso. We could handle all of that. And regarding the um, large workforce, uh, if you wanted, let's say you created your uh, your workforce category and uh, and then you want to break it up by class, you can uh, you can do that through your imports as well. So you don't just have to do the entire range. You can import a single class or a single category, and uh, and especially for security objects, we try to include only those fields that uh, everyone already includes in their employment records, or or uh, really ought to be including like a lot of the basic information that you need to start off. So uh, if you do have a large workforce and you've got that information retained somewhere else you shouldn't have to change too much to get it in a format that's compatible with Expresso and save yourself a headache. Good. I work for a health insurance consortium and I need to make sure my group and our members are compliant. Expresso looks like a great tool, but is it overkill for what we need to cover? Well, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know if it's overkill because you have to implement the security rule security rule mandates that you implement a risk assessment. If you don't use something like Espresso, you're, you're, bound, you're back to spreadsheets. If you want to go, if you want to try it with, with that spreadsheet approach, have at it. <laughs> it's, not, it's a totally non-trivial. You don't get out of doing the risk assessment. You don't get out of it if you're an insurance plan. You don't get out of it if you're a business associate. You have to do a risk assessment. I, you know, we've showed you. We went down the spreadsheet route. Others have too. That's what you. That, if you don't use something like Espresso, that's what you're left with. You know, so overkill. I mean, I would say no because Espresso within the first three hours could let you do the baseline risk assessment. I mean, how 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 just that by itself. If you try to create all these spreadsheets and do all this nonsense that 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 was a failed sort of failed attempt to at solve the problem. How much time and effort do you think you're going to spend doing that? versus spending $2,500 with us and then doing it in three hours and being able to approve it over time, improve upon it over time. So I mean, you tell me if, if it's overkill or not, right? Overkill is a, is a word relative to something. Uh, and I'm, I'm, my response would be relative to spreadsheets, no, it's not overkill. Relative to any other alternative I can think of, no, it's not, it's not overkill. Well, that's pretty much it. All right, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we're not going to do a. Um, um, uh, and it's totally espresso based webinar next next time. We're going to do a, web, uh, a webinar that explores a particular risk and what how is that defined and how you deal with it. So we're going to drop down to a, a, a more, much more detailed granular level and that'll be that'll be both next month's webinar and next month's newsletter and those of you that follow our newsletter know that um, that the webinars usually correspond to the newsletter now if you guys some of you are new and you're not members of our free newsletter if you become members of our free newsletter you get two products for free you actually can get 
a breach notification training, okay, which is what we sell. It's a product that we sell. It's not something that we, you know, normally give away, but we, you know, we, we do that for newsletter subscribers. And you get the fourth edition of the HIPAA Survival Guide. So if you're not uh, currently subscribers to our newsletter, then uh, you can go out to either uh, the HIPAA Survival Guide website or store.hipposurvivalguide.com and click on newsletter. Uh, and you'll see all the archived copies of the newsletter, which is really good study material. We've been doing this for um, over five years now. Um, so there's a lot of archived stuff out there that is worthwhile to read, and you can pick and choose what, what you want to read. But that's where you can subscribe to uh, the newsletter if you're not currently a subscriber. Any other questions? Not at this time. All right, great. Thank you. It's been my pleasure being with you today. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Have a good one.